I'm sorry, did I, I didn't mention you. It's all right. Everybody Paul Blasch, knows, everybody my, knows colleague, me. Paul Blasch, my colleague who will speak on Catalonia. Um, <laughs> thank you, Andy. Okay, so thank you so much. I'm very honored to uh, um, be involved in these sessions. Uh, I'll talk about uh, Catalonia and Spain at the crossroads, so it's about probably Western Europe in a way. And uh, uh, in December of uh, 1918, um, that is basically in the aftermath of World War I and in the wake of the collapse of the central empires, the New York Times reported um, in this uh, in December of 1918, as I said, that there was a strong Catalan movement in favor of self-determination. This uh, province that denied that had ever been conquered was in favor of political autonomy. Um, almost 100 years later, this last uh, July, CNN was reporting that more than one million people were protesting in uh, marching uh, in the streets of Barcelona against the uh, ruling of the Constitutional Court on a new uh, law uh, granting autonomy to Catalonia. So <clears throat> in 100 years, it doesn't seem like much has changed, or, uh, or at least that is what it seems to me. And so it is true that after the uh, transition to democracy in Spain, Catalonia was granted a, an autonomy, but that uh, so-called estatut, this is the word that is used uh, for autonomy laws in Spain, was implemented very gra gradually, and it was very... Uh, constrained or it was subjected to all the vagaries of the Spanish political process. It uh, uh, underwent very restrictive legislation in the early 1980s. Then it only was uh, implemented when there were hung parliaments and the uh, Spanish uh, national parties needed the support of the Catalan minority. And then after 2000, there was a recentralization process. So by the early uh, 2000s, uh, a new government uh, in, the Catalan, in the Catalan autonomy decided to introduce a new autonomy law to, so uh, they called it to federalize the relationship with Spain. This law was approved by 88% of the Catalan parliamentarians, both the left and the right, and then it was sent according to constitutional procedure to be uh, uh, approved by the Spanish Cortes. It was renegotiated considerably, watered down, and finally approved by the Catalan population in a referendum. Uh, um, the uh, Conservative Party and the Spanish Ombudsman uh, decided to appeal the decision uh, before the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court then uh, introduced a very restrictive decision in early July of this year, after four years of deliberation, and having out of the 12 members, one deceased and the other four with expired terms, basically because uh, to renew the Constitutional Court, you need the support of three-fifths of the Spanish Parliament, and uh, the Conservative Party in Spain vetoed any, um, any new uh, appointments. Uh, this is what led to these massive uh, protests, and that's where uh, we are now, and so that's why I call this a Spain and Catalonia at the crossroads. I think that underlying this tension between, uh, you know, push for more autonomy and restrictive responses from the Spanish government, uh, behind that there are two big underlying issues. Uh, one is that the Constitution, Spanish Constitution is a very flexible document. It was negotiated by many parties uh, with very vague uh, um, words so that everybody could consent to the Constitution of 1978 after the transition to democracy. And in that situation, the institutional structure of the, of the state is very important to sustain the rights of minorities. Um, and this, uh, the protection of minority rights normally is um, achieved through over-representation of minorities. The problem is that the Catalan minority that accounts for 17% of the population in the lower chamber only has about 13% of representation, in the upper chamber 9%, and the Constitutional Court 
not because of any quota, but just because of negotiations among parties, at most gets one out of the 12 members, and normally a very moderate uh, legal scholar uh, for that matter. The other thing that uh, it, um, leads to a lot of tension is that normally in a federal system, the only way to protect minorities is that everyone is a minority. So do you have these uh, always um, um, overlapping coalitions or shifting coalitions that allow everyone to rule a bit and so no one is exploited by no one, by anyone else. But that's not the case in Spain where Catalans basically are always in a position of being a minority against all the others. This complicates um, the relationship between Madrid and Barcelona extremely. The second problem, so the one problem is the constitutional, the constitution and the, uh, um, the interpretation of the constitution. The other one is that there are very strong financial imbalances at this point in Spain for reasons that I have no time to uh, go into um, because I have to have this dictator here for the good of everyone. Um, but certainly there are strong financial imbalances and uh, let me sh just show to you what is the relationship, the, what is the flow, so this is in percentage terms of the Catalan GDP, the red bars from a 2002 and 2005, about uh, more, almost 30%, um, so the Catalans pay about 30% of uh, in taxes, um, but they only receive back in, uh, in terms of a spending, both through the central government and the uh, regional government, about less than 20%. So there is a deficit, or if you will, if you will a net transfer to a Spain of about 10% of GDP. This is uh, basically equal to all the transfers that the European Union has been making to Spain for the last 20 years. But uh, you know, in the case of the Euro, EU transfers, well, Germans are about 100, mil, 100, 100 million people Catalans are only six, seven million people, so you can see that there is here something that is not working well. Let me show to you how this has an impact on the welfare of Catalans uh, in just one area, public health. Um, this is uh, a graph that uh, correlates public spending in health per person, public and private spending, uh, with per capita income in European nations. You can see that there is this very strong relationship, the, Vertical axis is the public spending in health, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, euros uh, per capita, and then income is in the horizontal uh, axis. And you can see this very strong relationship. Richer countries are spending more um, and uh, poorer less, but it's a very strong relationship. Put Catalonia in uh, the graph, and in terms of per capita income is uh, higher than the Swedish, the British, the Irish, well, I Ireland is has disappeared, but uh, this is before the crisis, this graph, right? But it's uh, very high in terms of income, yet the uh, expenditure is very low. Uh, you know, some people, when they see this graph, say, well, they are, must be very efficient in the delivery of, uh, you know, a health uh, provision, but, uh, you know, I don't think that's the case. So these tensions are building up. I only, I think, have two minutes to go, and so the question is, what's next? Um, and what's next is that, Till now, the Catalan movement has been always pro-autonomy. It has be, been about the construction of a federal system or of having regional autonomy within Spain and naturally within the European Union. But in the last 10 years, as a result of these tensions, there has been a change in public opinion. And there are different surveys, and of course, it depends how you uh, ask questions. And, but if you ask the question, the, the the, the broadest, more encompassing survey, uh, like last year, beginning of 2009, um, asking whether they would vote or not for independence, 50% of the interviews, uh, interviewed people said yes, um, no, 18%, and abstention, 25%, which is a huge change. Uh, sometimes it's only 40%, but it's in the order of 40, 50%. Um, and this, I don't know if you can see this, uh, this is interesting to me because the survey is, allows us to distinguish between those born in Catalonia, those in the rest of Spain, rest of Europe, and in the rest of the world, since Catalonia is a very big uh, uh, place of attracting a lot of um, migration. And basically, um, there is a plurality in favor of independence in all cases, especially, um, you know, majority in, born in Catalonia and 
in those that are in the rest of Europe and the rest of the world are in favor. It's the green color. I don't know if you can see this very well. Um, which is very much in line with the kind of uh, Catalan uh, ideas or Catalanist movement, which has nothing to do with ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, conceptions of uh, nationalism, but rather a civic type of uh, nationalism that uh, is proud to think of a Catalans as those that live and work and in pay taxes and get their taxes transferred to Madrid, as you know, all of them are, are considered Catalans, uh, very much, I think, like an American or a, a conception of identity. And um, what's next, I'm not sure, but I'll finish with a graph uh, that puts all these in a sort of semi-theoretical context. This is a graph that has two axes. One is the level of economic integration, and the, un the other one is the level of external threat. So you can think of the vertical as globalization, the second one as the level of Kantian peace in the world. And the world has gone through many phases. It went from a place that was mildly integrated in certain markets in the Middle Ages with uh, low levels of external threat because there were no cannons, to a place that was extremely uh, contentious and uh, with national markets, all of them closed. And the number of countries went down as a result of these two forces, the need to protect yourself against neighbors and the need to have national markets where you could place your goods. But after um, the end of the 19th century with Pax Britannica and especially with Pax Americana, and then after the collapse of the uh, 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 Berlin Wall, what we have done is to a place where, at least in Europe, we have Kantian peace and globalization is, is still thriving, I guess. Nothing is going to happen yet, uh, at least not, not after the G20 meeting. Um, and so in that context, there are the possibility of becoming a uh, unit that has maximum uh, autonomy or sovereignty is, uh, comes back again. Right? Thank you so much.